Hello, everyone, and thanks for coming to my talk on um, lysine targeting covalent inhibitors. Um, I hope you find it interesting. Um, so I work at the Institute for Cancer Research. Um, we're an academic institute, and our role is primarily to try and discover new um, and innovative treatments for cancer. Um, now, one of our major challenges and one of the things our, our focus on for the last few years has been this problem of resistance. So we've come up with many fantastic um, uh, uh, target therapies that bring great benefit to patients. Um, but eventually and almost inevitably, we see resistance to that and relapse of the patient. Now, EGFR is quite a nice example of this. So activation of EGFR by this mutation leads it to become an oncoprotein. So lots of people came up with some great um, reversible inhibitors of that, which um, benefit patients in the clinic. You get inevitable resistance, one of the main mechanisms of this is the T790M gatekeeper mutation, if you like um, the terms it used to have in kinase drug discovery quite a lot. Um, and this led to resistance by increasing the affinity for ATP and decreasing the affinity for your particular target, and you lost the therapeutic index. Um, another generation of EGFR inhibitors then came along to deal with this double mu in EGFR. And a good example is from Ozimertinib from AstraZeneca. What these did was then exploit this um, there's an old idea, but a renaissance idea of target covalent inhibitors, where you could form a covalent bond with cysteine 797 um, and regain the activity that you would sort of have against this double mutant EGFR and compete with the ATP affinity. But again, unfortunately, what you tend to see is further mutation um, of patients treated with osimertinib for um, where the cysteine 797 mutates for a serine, and this is now no longer nucleophilic and you lose the activity. So the question we sort of sit around and ask ourselves is what can we do about this and what changes can we make? Now going slightly left field for this, because this is how we led to this idea about ways we might try to tackle this mechanism of resistance in cancer, was we had a project from many, many years ago against the molecular chaperone in 72. Now, um, molecular chaperones are a popular target for us. Um, they sort of work by um, hydrolyzing ATP to ADP, they use that energy to stabilize misfolded proteins in cancer cells, there are lots of misfolded proteins in cancer cells, and they become quite reliant on chaperones to keep viability for themselves. And so by targeting this, this is an idea we fit to sit to with um, called non oncogene addiction. Um, so we were quite interested in whether we could find an inhibitor of HP72 and thought it might work quite well against cancer. So we tried this out and we did all the usual tricks that I'm sure the rest of you guys would have tried as well of high throughput screening, which like fragment based approaches, but um, we had lots and lots of crystal structures, particularly the nucleotide binding domain that you see in the bottom right corner there. But we weren't really able to find a start point to target this molecule. And the project wound up because we couldn't really get any further with it. Now, one of the sort of challenges around this, or, or one of the things we sort of discovered when you search for the literature on HCP72, because we weren't the only ones looking into it, was there are type binding inhibitors or ligands for it, rather than say, say drugs, but there certainly are type binding ligands for it. Um, and particularly this one um, done by Vanalis, uh, 155008. It's actually quite type binding. So it shows that the pocket is very ligandable. Um, it's just that it doesn't, it does also explain why we couldn't get our high throughput screening to work particularly well, as we don't have a lot of nucleosides in our screening collection. So we have this type binding start point, but this, the problem with it, um, or the challenges with it, but certainly one of the major problems with it is that the cellular activity is quite modest. Um, that's possibly why, therefore, when I didn't push it any further. But we said they confirmed this, that, that this compound is definitely a type binding ligand for HP72. Now, we'd wound it up as a drug discovery project, but we were still really interested to be able to come up with a cell active chemical probe of HB72 and all its many, many isoforms that it has within cells, which is not understood at all, um, in order to investigate the chemical biology of HB72 and its role in cancer. So, our idea was to overcome this high affinity for ATP and ADP. Could we design a targeted covalent inhibitor to solve this problem? So, we were able to get funding for this. and. Um, Dr. Jonathan Petager, who's now um, got his PhD, um, started off on this project. So the way we went about this was a slightly naive and simplistic design, I suppose. So we took the crystal structure of HCP72, um, we sort of looked around it, and luckily there is a cysteine. It's sort of at the bottom of this solvent channel down here. Uh, it looked to our sort of naive eyes as being somewhat solvent exposed, and maybe we could get hold of it. 
We designed a linker to sort of span this distance, it's about eight angstroms to reach this distance and to get down there. And we put a soft electrophile on the end, um, acrylamide or an acrylate at this particular point. And that was our design. Um, so it seemed rather simplistic, but it's what we all thought we would give a go. So Johnny started his PhD and I said, why don't you make this compound at the bottom right? Um, once you've made it, then we'll just try it out and we'll see what happens and see where it goes from that. At least we'll find out if 1617 is reactive. So like all areas of drug discovery, um, if you haven't got an assay, you can't test what's going on. Now, HB7, all the HB17s have some challenges when it comes to functional assays. They're quite difficult to get to work. Um, and for all of the projects and all the work we've done on the HP 17s, we've always relied on the FP assay, the fluorescent polarization assay, to really understand what's happening. Now, if you haven't seen the FP assay before, the idea is um, relatively simple. That's why, as a chemist, I quite like it. Um, it relies on this FP probe, which is a ligand for the molecule, in this case, just ADP. Um, it's covalently bound to a fluorophore. Now, when the FP probe is bound to the protein, it tumbles very slowly because the protein is very, very big. So we shine polarized light at it. Uh, the slope tumbling means we get lots of polarization at the other end. If it's just, if it's insolvent and just tumbling over really, really quickly, then when you shine plain polarized light at it, the tumbling means that the polarization of the light that comes out of it is then lost. And so you can tell the difference between when the probe is bound and when it's not bound to the protein. Now, the good thing then is if we add an inhibitor, or in this case, really, it's just a competitive ligand that can displace um, the FP probe, if it pushes more of that FP probe out from the protein, it will tumble more quickly. Um, and then we will be able to tell whether the inhibitor is bound to the protein by uh, inference. And what you get is then a classic uh, S-curve for this. So you see the response. We increase the inhibitor concentration. We get more and more displacement of the probe. And we can work out an IC50 from this. Now, that's all well and good. And under an equilibrium and an, a reversible compound, you would expect this to be unchanging as long as the protein to decompose or something over time. So we could leave this and it would never change. But what we're expecting to see for a, a covalent inhibitor is the compound appears to become more and more active the longer we leave it and the curves will shift to the left. Um, this is one of the reasons why it's very, very risky to compare IC50s for covalent inhibitors because simply they become more potent the longer you leave them. So if you want more potent, just leave it longer. Um, and it's also extremely risky to compare covalent inhibitor IC50s to non-covalent compounds, which should largely be avoided. But nonetheless, this was the signature we were expecting if we were going to see a covalent compound. Um, so in the FPA, I say we convert all of our IC50s in the KI so that things are comparable. And uh, we've seen this change in apparent KI within fake covalent binding. So this is the compound that we made first off. This is the one we designed. The synthesis of that is actually quite challenging, but um, we're not going to, be able to talk about this today. But the conclusion we sort of came to was that um, nucleosides are very difficult to make, um, and every one of them is a challenge and requires a lot of thought. But we made this first one. It was what we wanted, and we thought we'd try it out. This is the first one we tested, and it goes in the FP assay, and much to our great surprise, it worked, or at least it appeared to work. So the initial KI is the, the sort of IC50 we get from the action. T was not, it's not really T was not, it's just the earliest time we can measure. And as we left it for an increasing period of time, we see a shift to the left. Now, as you hope you can see, these times are quite long. So we are having to leave this quite a long time in order to, to see this sort of effect happening, but nonetheless, it seemed to be what we would expect to see from a covalent compound. Now, this isn't enough information or enough data. We need to be able to compare this to controls to know whether this is real. So we take the double bond out so we can't have a covalent bond form. And now it's just an equilibrium binder. And we see that we don't see a time dependence in the IC50 across the same time period. The protein just is thankfully quite stable and just sort of sits there with the living back. The other thing we always do is to compare where we still have the electrophile, but don't, uh, we're not able to bind the molecule reversibly. So this is most commonly done by leaving the protecting group, the acetonide in for this dial of the ribose. So if you know the SAR of HB70, this dial is really, really important. You can't get away with it. So it's blocked it binding in the active site, but we still don't see the time dependency or any binding at all from that. The other assay we use a lot was the intact protein mass spec. Um, this sort of difference from trypsin digest mass spec. So you see the entire mass of the protein. So it's quite good for covalent compounds. Now on this graph at the bottom, what I hope you're seeing is at T was naught, we have the, the mass of HB72 and it's sort of disappearing over the next 72 hours. 
And then to the right, where we've added the covalent compound, it's going up as we're increasing the tagged level of the protein. We can do the same controls with the left file removed or blocking the reversal binding. And by mass spec, you don't see any tagging of the protein. So this was quite a surprise because it worked. It wasn't expected to work at the first attempt. Um, as far as all of our data sort of showed us that the covalent binding was both specific and required this reversible binding event. It's also what you expect from a TCI. Um, and um, so that was quite reassuring. But things are never quite that simple because what it turned out was that cysteine 17, even though we designed it to try and tag cysteine 17, was not the residue that was the nucleophile. Now, the reason we were able to show this um, thing we've used quite a lot is single point mutation of residues that you think are important for covalent bond formation is a really good way of trying to work out what's going on with the protein. So we mutate out cysteine 17, replace it with an alanine, and which can be nucleophilic, and we still saw the time dependence in the FP and we still saw the mass spec sex as well, we still form an adduct. So it couldn't be cysteine 17 that was forming a covalent bond. Now the workout was going on, if we could have got a covalent complex bound in a crystal structure, then we could just see what was happening, but we couldn't get that. And that seems quite common for um, covalent crystal structures. So what we were able to get was this reversely bound complex. Now we had a couple of these sort of confirmations come out, but this one was particularly useful for this one. Now what you see is tyrosine 15 in a down confirmation. So there's lots of crystal structures with HB70, and this tyrosine 15 is quite a poor residue in how HB70 works, um, but it is quite flexible. So when it's in the down confirmation, we saw our electrophiles start to point towards the back of the pocket, and it was in close proximity to lysine 56. Now at the time, there wasn't a huge amount out there on targeting lysine as a covalent inhibitor. There's no reason why that wouldn't work. Lysines are just amines, they're perfectly nucleophilic, um, but it was still would be kind of surprising that this was what was going on. So we came along, we did our same trick again. We just made the single point mutation to remove the lysine. So we made the alanine mutation and lysine 56. Now in the FP assay, we lose all that time dependency and the electrophile no longer reacts uh, within there. We don't see a time dependent FP. And in the mass spec, you see the same effect as well. So in the mutant, there's no tagging of the protein when, um, when this is the mutant protein. So this confirmed that lysine 56 was actually the electrophile or the nucleophile that we were interested in that was going to react with our compound, much to our surprise, really. So we published this story in Angavanta um, a couple of years ago, and we also published a review on lysine targeting covalent inhibitors, largely because we didn't know much about them at the time uh, or who was um, um, or what the rest of the community were already doing on this sort of front. So it was a good thing for us to sort of understand what was happening. So that was all really pleasing, um, but it was really just a detective story. So you see from the timing of that, how long you have to leave the compounds in order to form a covalent adduct that simply was not going to be good enough to get our main target, which is to get a cell active probe. So we needed to optimize that compound further. Now we found a way to get around some of these challenges with HP70 with something new. How can we optimize the compound to make it work better and get to the probe? So this is an arguable point, but I would say if you start off with a modest covalent inhibitor, you want to make it better, then you really do need to understand the underlying parameters that are driving that activity. So this is just a little bit of theory around how covalent inhibitors work. So they go this two-step process, they set up this equilibrium with a pseudo-equilibrium constant K kappa Y to form a reversible complex, and then they undergo um, the formation of the covalent bond, which is controlled by this first order rate constant K and ACT. Um, so this two-step process is actually crucial for you actually having a TCI rather than just simply a, a molecule that's overly reactive. And the way you can sort of pull apart what's ha happening here is based upon this and type relationship and this slightly odd looking term K-OBS. So uh, we always like quite like K-OBS because it's a rate constant that isn't a constant. Um, and it's slightly odd because it changes uh, whenever you change the concentration of the, of the TCI that you're using. Now it's been increasing concentration of the TCI, k goes up, but goes up in a non-linear way as you're saturating the protein. Once you fully saturate the protein, um, then that's as fast as it's going to go. And then we're seeing that is the formation of the covalent bond. So when k is maximal, then that's what K and ACT is. The much more interesting sort of end is down this bottom end, where at low concentrations below the um, pseudo-equilibrium constant K-capital I, 
uh, the curve goes quite linear, and the slope of this curve is the second order rate constant k in act over ki, and that's the second order rate constant that drives the actual reaction that you're interested in. So this is the main thing we're trying to optimize, k in act over ki. Now, the good thing about um, TCIs is the fact that they do this two-step process. So they give you two opportunities to optimize your compound and overcome some of the challenges to go with it. You can improve reversible affinity by improving Ki, or you can improve K and ACT in a way that's separate to the intrinsic reactivity by improving K and ACT, and that's why they're so useful. Now, to understand or to be able to measure this, this was a little bit more tricky. Now, what most people in the literature do, you will find, is that you use a bit of theory to pull apart um, uh, a functional assay to see from the amount of product you're forming whether you're getting um, a covalent inhibitor. Now, we didn't have a functional assay for the F, uh, for HB70, and mass spec is not sensitive enough to do what we wanted to do. So, um, what we had to do was go back to our FP assay and try to pick that apart to see if we could use that. Now, this stems back all the way back to Huang back in probably 20 years, nearly 20 years ago now, who showed a relationship to the IC50 that you measure in an FP assay and the bound fraction of the protein ethanol in this case. And the reason why that's important is if you know the bound fraction, then you know the effective concentration of the protein. And it's the change in the effective concentration of the protein, which is the parameter that you're interested in, in order to determine what K in acting Ki is. So without going back, so we spent a long time obviously picking apart that equation to work out how to do that. Um, it's in the paper if you're interested, but this is the method we're going to follow. So we start off with sort of rough titration, and the sort of activity you might guess for your particular compound of um, across lots of different times and lots of different concentrations. It gives this sort of classic shift in IC50 curves, depending on the, um, as it becomes more potent over time. Now, what we're interested in is then the bound fraction. So we use this bit of theory to get back to what the bound fraction of the um, protein would be. And by extrapolating then these changes back to what a theoretical T equals naught would be, we can see what the world would have looked like before equilibrium and the formation of the covalent bond got in the way. If we then plot these then back on an S-curve with the different concentrations of our TCI, we then can um, work out what we call the initial Ki, which is basically the, the reversible Ki affinity of the molecule, as best as we can from this data. Now, once we know that Ki, we can then go back to this data and redesign a new titration, which is all the values below Ki. So what we're trying to work out here is K and act over Ki, the second order rate constant. So this is where you determine this at low concentration. From these multiple curves that we then get, then work out the bound fraction again. And now we're looking at the gradient of these slopes. And the gradient of these slopes is the rate of change of the bound fraction with respect to time, which is the same as K-OBS, or at least equivalent to K-OBS. So then convert these gradients back to K-OBS, plot them against the TCI value. And then the gradient of this curve is now, or this straight line is now K and act over Ki. Once we have K and act over Ki, we can then work out all the other parameters that might be useful for us such as from the initial Ki, we can work out what K and ACT is. And then um, even though K and ACT is useful, but its units are slightly disturbing, so we tend to convert it back to the TF int, which is the half-life um, infinite concentration, which is the saturation of the proteins, in this case, 32 minutes. Now, so we have, we have a way of measuring it. We have an idea how we're going to do that. So how do we design a molecule that might be more potent? So our first idea is you want to improve the reversible fit. This would be due to, or this would be carried out by trying to mix back in the features on the Venalis compound that was tight binding with our covalent inhibitor. So how do we get this ring system back into the molecule? Now, the way we did that is look back at our first generation crystal structures. And the one on the right, the one which is B, is the one we've seen before, where T tyrosine 15 is down, and our retrovirus is close to lysine 56. And the one on the left is another confirmation that we saw where tyrosine 15 is up, and we're a long way from um, lysine 56. We can't form a covalent bond from here. Now, this A confirmation seems to mimic really nicely um, the Venalis type confirmation we see below where the aromatic ring sort of sits up against tyrosine 15. So the model we came up with was this now a three-step model whereby we have to form this reversible complex that has to transition to this pre-covalent complex where the electrophile can then be closer to the nucleophile. But the pre uh, the reversible complex could drive reversible affinity 
And we have to just be able to transition to this pre-covalent complex and get the covalent bond. To see whether that model made any sense, uh, we went back to the CSD to see what crystal structures could tell us about the conformations of adenosine type compounds. And this was the angle, the dihedral angle that we required in order to reach to get to the confirmation that we needed. And so that was well populated within the CSD. So that was quite encouraging. Um, and then we just used a little bit of modeling just to work out where the best place to put the electron was that would be close to the nucleophile in this scenario. So, and para seemed to fit the best place for that. So that gives us a way of improving KI, or there's a way we hope to improve KI. So what about K and X? So uh, what we required was a hard electrophile to target the lysine. So our original design was against um, cysteine and therefore a soft um, electrophile. Um, but since we're now targeting lysine, we needed something different. Now you look for the, the literature and the most common one is now this ever popular sulfonyl fluoride, sort of water stable, it's quite nice in um, for aspects. Um, the good thing about sulfonyl fluoride is it, has lots of, it is hard, it has lots of, um, sort of angles and distances that would be better accommodated at its electrophilic center. Um, but the most important thing I think to us was the fact that the Lehman group is only fluoride. So if you look at cysteine um, acrylamide electrophiles, there is no Lehman group and that makes life a lot easier. But with these hard um, electrophiles, say like an activated ester, the Lehman group is gonna be quite large and has to be accommodated within a protein binding site. And that wouldn't work for many proteins and certainly wouldn't work for HCV 70 so sulfonyl fluoride is what we wanted, and this is therefore the molecule that we designed that we wanted to get to. Unfortunately, at the time we were doing this, we just did not have the chemistry to make this compound, um, no matter what we try. Um, making this ether bond down here is a complete nightmare, um, and trying to accommodate an electrophile within that, it's just couldn't, we just couldn't get it to work. Now, what we could get to go was um, this commercially available sulfonyl for a sulfuride electrophile that will react on the alcohol and give this ester and it works quite well. It's quite, and the sulfonyl stable to the hydrolysis conditions at the end. And so we were able to get hold of this one. Unfortunately, there's a cost to that. Um, whilst the Venardis type compound, this is type binding in the FP assay. When you incorporate an ester at that position, it drops off a lot um, and goes back to a pretty modern 10 micromoles. So that's a bit disappointing. What it does do is allow us to investigate all the other things and investigate our FP assay that we designed to see whether we could do what we wanted to do with it. So our uh, ester sulfonyl fluoride, we put that into our FP assay and quite pleasingly, there was a big shift to the left. Um, and now not within 24 hours, we're talking a couple of hours, we were shifting to the left automatically. Um, so this seemed to confirm our design hypothesis that this sort of fitted in the way it needed to go. But we needed to understand it a lot more to understand what changes have done what to our molecule. So we did our normal controls. Um, so uh, blocking the binding, uh, the mutants, carrying this out in the mass spec assay, and all confirmed a specific binding event um, that uh, in a way that was consistent with our first generation compound. Now we made a library of these um, from previous work we've done. We knew quite a lot about the eight position on the adenine and its importance as sort of the reverse quinoline for ligands. This sort of um, quinoline type molecule was always quite good. Uh, so we incorporated that within it. Um, that improves the reversible affinity somewhat. Uh, uh, these are graphs of chaos versus the concentration of the inhibitor that we put in, as you can just sort of done on the same scale to show how much of an improvement you get from this change from sulfonyl fluoride type one to from the acryl uh, acrylate that we started off previously. From the FP assay analysis, we can get the second order rate constant, which is, shows 108 fold improvement when you quantify it, which is quite good. Um, now, by picking that apart, the other things we can therefore do, we find that most of that is driven by an improvement in K and ACT rather than an improvement in the reversible affinity. So this ester reads up mess things up and doesn't make it really much better a reversible affinity than um, where we started from. But the TRFINF, which is the formation of the covalent bond once you saturate the protein, the change was going from 12 and a half hours of our first acrylate compound down to 26 minutes now with um, the sulfonyl fluoride. So that was a massive improvement and really shows what difference you can make with the electrophile. So uh, we published that story of how we optimized that compound and did all the analysis in um, JMEDCAM a couple of years ago. So we're almost there, but we're still not there. 
So that's not enough still. We were about an order of magnitude short on our second order rate constant from where we wanted to be. And by having this carbonyl here, we increase the intrinsic reactivity of the sulfur fluoride to places we didn't want it to be either. So we still wanted what our original design was. Now, if you can ever have a slide or at least two arrows that summarize a year's work, and here's going to be one. Um, and this also coincided with COVID, so that's um, a great fun. So I was able to get some more funding for a new PhD student for this. This is James's work. Um, and what he, basically his first mission was, was to work out how to sort this problem out and make this molecule. So the keys to this were to send protect the nitrogens. So we have three send protections. These can't migrate. That's really important in order to put the molecule together. Um, and that took quite a lot of working out. The other key point was this um, chemistry that's been developed by Mike Willis's group. It gives you a late stage sulfur fluorosulfonation via palladium cross coupling, which has been absolutely crucial to get this electrophiling really late in the molecule and sort out with some of the selectivity issues you have going previously. So we have that compound now in hand. We run it through the mass spec assay and it does exactly what we were kind of hoping it would do, but that's not enough. We need to run it through all the F uh, the kinetic FP assay that we've developed, but that takes much longer to get done, unfortunately. Um, if it does do all the things we're hoping it's going to do, then this is the activity-based protein profile and probe that we've designed to then get this into investigate what hb 70s are up to within cancer cells. So we have this clickable linker in using some chemistry we developed in the group previously. Okay, so that's what I want to get to on HSB70, but the point really was that we learned all this stuff about how to design um, lysine target and covalent inhibitors using HSB70. And the question we got to at this point was, can we apply this to a more druggable target that can maybe have some, um, or maybe overcome some of the resistance challenges that we see in cancer? So if we went back to our EGFR and our triple mutant EGFR, which shows resistance to ozimertinib by loss of the um, cysteine to a serine, can we overcome the resistance to this compound? So we look back at the crystal structure the same way we did for HB70. We find this distance to what is now the catalytic glycine, K745, and that distance um, seems kind of reasonable. Um, the good thing about this catalytic glycine is, in principle, it can't mutate because if it does, then the protein becomes non-functional. There's questions over whether it's reactive. There's some evidence for that in the literature where people have done sort of studies to try to look for reactivity of lysines into various different proteins, and it looks like we should be okay there. Um, and the question would be what the linker should be, what the sort of flexibility of that linker and the distance you want to have from that. Um, and probably the most important question still is in terms of getting it towards being a drug is what the electrophile should be. So we're pretty certain we need a hard center at this point. There are several different types of reactions you might be able to think about for that. And the nature of that leaving group is always going to be a key issue to fit them in. So can EGFR be a lysine TCI and can it be drug-like? So this is where we started from this. Um, we took the cysteine pockets. We wanted to sort that out because that's not going to be there anymore. Um, and just wanted to see what we could put in there that would be happy with the serine that's now mutated into the triple mutant. And actually, this, the simple amide um, was, uh, was seen to be quite well accommodated within that particular point. The other thing we had to sort out before proceeding was what the linker may look like and can it be accommodated at all. So there was no SAR that we were aware of, of what could come off of this, um, of this indole, of, this particular, of, of the indole nitrogen that wasn't really known. So we had to look at some sort of simple linkers and see if they still bound EGFR and just didn't block binding. So some early data on that particular at the top shows that you can accommodate both these things quite happily and you still maintain the reversible affinity for EGFR. And the stage we're now currently at is we're designing a full library of these, still based on sulfonyl fluoride. We still think this is where you would start, even though it's probably not where you would finish, to try to accommodate different linkers based upon our rational now design to reach around and grab this catalytic glycine um, and design a, um, a covalent inhibitor of EGFR and then apply that to the resistance problem of cancer cells. Okay, so that's all I wanted to talk about on this. Um, in summary, so hopefully I've shown that um, lysine tagging covalent inhibitors are potentially could be really important and particularly important when the cysteine is not available, which is often the case in order to overcome some of our challenges. Um, as a minimum, we're hoping that we'll get to some potent selective cell approach with chemical biology. So I think that's really useful in, uh, in order to understand what proteins are important for cancer. Um, I would always advocate if you want to add, progress a modest activity lysine TCI is to understand the underlying parameters of KNAT and KI. Um, we've been applying what we've learned from HSB72 
where we're trying to get a chemical probe to the design of EGFR inhibitors to overcome this resistance in cancer and hopefully in compounds that are more druggable and you can make more analogs of than the super challenging um, nucleoside derivatives. But the key question and something we're still looking to push forward um, in the next couple of years is what would an, an electrophile look like in a, a, um, a lysine targeting TCI drug? Because um, it's probably not going to be sulfonyl fluoride uh, for a variety of reasons. And therefore, this is the next stage for us trying to understand what that electrophile should be. And therefore, you can pull apart the relationship between intrinsic reactivity and KNAC. So there's a few acknowledgements. Um, so most of, or actually all this work was done by um, PhD students. So we've got three great PhD students in the room, uh, Lindsay, Johnny, and now James is the current PhD student work on there. James is working with um, AstraZeneca as part of an MRC um, grant. So real great thanks to those guys. We have several um, PhD co-supervisors across these three students. Um, so Keith started this whole thing off and then uh, Ian joined in more uh, recently. Rob uh, is a great crystallographer within the ICR and um, helps with all the crystallography that we started up on that, along with Jan Vai, who um, drove a lot of the early crystallography of the HB70. Paul Clark's a biologist, that hopefully we'll give him some probes soon, he can find them um, to pick apart how HB70 works. Um, Tom uh, is James's PhD supervisor at AstraZeneca, so it's been great working with him and um, Derek for driving a lot of the biochemistry on EGFR, since that's their expertise. Um, um, particularly thank Rosemary um, as well for letting us chemists have a go at some of the assays and things and helping us to redesign them. Um, Mick and three of the team that I'm in, um, thanks to Nicola and particularly Gary for um, lots of chats and advice on ways of improving the project. And within our structural chemistry teams, I particularly want to thank Marion for helping us set up the intact protein mass spec and turning it into an assay that's been incredibly useful over the years. And thank you all for listening.